Hello and welcome to video one for week five for Math 300. In this video, I want to talk about the idea of nonlinear coordinate systems. So these are coordinate systems other than the conventional Cartesian coordinates, different ways of identifying points in Euclidean space. We're going to introduce the idea of nonlinear coordinate systems by looking at polar coordinates. So if I have a point in Euclidean space in R2, which is indicated by coordinates x and y, well, that means it's over some distance x and it's up some distance y. That's how we do Cartesian coordinates. Polar coordinates are a way of identifying points. Instead of giving its coordinate over in some direction and up in some direction, I'm going to give two other pieces of information, a radius and an angle. So the radius is going to be the distance out from the origin of the point. All points have a distance out from the origin. And the angle is going to be the angle of the vector to that point starting from the positive x-axis going counterclockwise. And again, all points, I can draw that vector, and I can draw some angle to the positive x-axis. And in that way, I can specify any points. If I want to specify a point up here, well, I give some radius, I give some angle, that tells me exactly which point I want. These are coordinates because they do what the Cartesian coordinates do, is they specify points in the plane, but they don't do it in the conventional way, they do it in a new way. And we call these non-linear because the coordinates aren't just going along one line and then going on some other line. They use things like angles. Curvilinear is another word that you might see in various other places for these type of coordinate systems. So now we have this notion of polar coordinates, of identifying points in the plane by an angle and a radius. We'd like to know how to go back and forth between polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. Well, if I have this r and this theta, then triangle ge geometry tells me that the x-coordinate is going to be r cos theta and the y-coordinate is going to be r sine theta. That's basically your trigonometry ratios. So to go from polar coordinates back to Cartesian coordinates, I can calculate the x-coordinate by taking r times the cosine of theta and calculate the y-coordinate by taking r times the sine of theta. If I want to go the other way, if I want to start with Cartesian coordinates, this r, well this is right triangle, so it's going to be the square root of the two sides of the right triangle, square root of x squared plus y squared. And this angle in terms of x and y, well y over x is the tangent of that angle, so the angle is going to be the inverse tangent of y over x. And that tells me how to go one direction and how to go the other direction. And this means I can go algebraically back and forth between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. In particular, I can do this for loci. So if I have a line, here's a vertical line in polar coordinates, I can change that in, in Cartesian coordinates. I can change that to polar coordinates by replacing x with r cos theta. So here's a locus in polar coordinates that describes the vertical line x equals 4. It now has both variables. It says the radius times the cosine of theta has to be 4, but particularly that product equals 4 is going to give us this line. Likewise, if I have the circle x squared plus y squared equals 4, well, x squared plus y squared is the same as r squared, because r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's the same as r squared equals 4, that's the same as r equal 2, and that makes sense. It's the circle of all points with radius 2. Radius is the distance out from the origin, so in polar coordinates, this circle is all points where the distance term r is equal to, and the angle can be anything. The angle doesn't show up in this equation, and that makes sense, because the points in the circle, we can have any angle where we want. In this way, I can go back and forth between our algebraic descriptions of shapes in Cartesian and polar coordinates. For the rest of this video, I want to give you some more examples of loci in polar coordinates, just to give you some practice and interpretation of what's going on. So the coordinates are r and theta. What about the locus r equals theta? The locus x equals y is a straight line in Cartesian coordinates. But the locus r equals theta is actually a spiral. So this says, as we go around, as the angle goes around, the radius is actually going to be increase the same rate of the angle. So if angle 0, angle pi over 2, angle pi, angle 3 pi over 2, angle 2 pi. Um, so this ha distance has to be 2 pi. And then I can keep going with higher angles, angle 5 pi over 2. So as the angle goes around, the radius is increasing at the rate of the angle. So this is going to be 3 pi out. This is going to be 4 pi out. And all of those distance happen 
when the angle to the positive x-axis is exactly the same. So the value of this angle and the value of this radius are precisely the same because the locus says r equal theta. This is tricky, but this is the same idea as interpreting y equals x as the straight diagonal line. Interpreting r equals theta, the only points that have the same radius and angle are the points on this spiral. Let's do some more, and this gets a little bit more complicated. r equals the absolute value of sine theta. So again, I want to start at theta equals zero. So if theta equals zero, then r equals zero. As theta increases, sine of theta also increases. When I get to theta equals pi over two, sine of that is one. So this is going to be height one. So here, these points, as the angle gets larger, the radius is getting larger. Then as I keep going, the angle increases again. The sine function is going to go back down to zero. So here, the radius is going to get smaller. And when I get to theta equals pi, sine of pi is zero, the radius is shrunk back down to zero. And then I repeat that as the angle increases here, the radius increases here, and when I get to uh, 3 pi over 2, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, but I'm taking the absolute values here, that makes sense because my radius has to be positive, so I get that this distance out here is also 1. And then as I keep going again, as the angle increases, the angles are going to get down to 2 pi, sine is going to get smaller, so the radius is going to get smaller, I get down to this, and that gives me this figure 8 shape. As theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, sine goes up to 1, down to 0, up to 1, down to 0. I have radius that goes out, and radius comes back, and radius goes out, and radius comes back. This is a shape called the cardioid, because it's supposed to vaguely re resemble the shape of a heart. So this says that the radius is 1 plus sine theta. So here, when theta is equal to 0, the radius is equal to 1, because the radius is 1 plus sine. And then as I go along here, as theta increases, the radius is going to be 1 plus that. So here, at theta equals pi over 2, the radius is equal to 2. So the radius has started at 1 and increases to 2. And then as I go back here, the sine term is going to get smaller, so the radius is going to decrease back down to 1 by the time I get to theta equal pi. And then here, I'm going to end up with a point at theta equals 3 pi over 2. The radius is going to be 1 minus 1, because the sine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. So my radius actually shrinks down to 0 here, and then it grows back to 1 as I go around this way. The key thing is that all of these points, if I put their polar coordinates, if I consider their radius and their angle and put them in this equation, they will satisfy. And any point that's not in this shape, if I put the radius and the angle into the equation, it won't satisfy, exactly like we have for loci in Cartesian coordinates. And let me give you one more example. Here's something that is, is quite interesting. Radius equals 3 times sine 2 theta. So 2 theta tells me that as I go around a circle, I'm actually going to do two whole periods of the sine function. Because sine 2 theta, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. The thing in here is going to go from 0 to 4 pi because I multiply by 2. 3 tells me sort of how far I go out. So these maximum radii will be 3. And this tells me that uh, the radius goes out and in out and in, out and in, out and in, as the oscillation of the sine function goes. So that gives me this fourfold clover shape as I go around for all the different angles. That might be a little bit tricky to think through, but, but sort of think about what these values are. Think about the points and the angles and what has to actually happen for this to make sense.